ברוך השם, you're a bad Jew. שלום. This episode is sponsored by Jewish Big Brothers and Big Sisters of LA. So when I hear that people are interested in signing up to be a big, I just want to go give them a hug and tell them it's the best choice you'll ever make. It's the best way to make an impact and to be with someone and trust the process. Know that Jewish Big Brothers, Big Sisters puts it together in a way that it makes an impact for everybody. And that connection for me is, is everything. If I had to choose one word of what it was like to have a big, it would be awesome. Just do it. Sign up for it. Everything that you're going to do is going to be more than you can imagine. If you want to make an impact on a child's life, Big Brothers and Big Sisters of L.A. is accepting applications today. Go to jbbbsla.org. That is jbbbsla.org. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Bad Jew, the place where there is no such thing as a bad Jew. And with me today is a dear friend of mine named Alyssa Bernstein and also another guest named David Hazoni. David hails all the way from Israel. They are representatives from a great organization called Z3. I highly recommend you all check it out. They have a conference coming up and I want to give David the chance to pitch this exciting conference. David, take it away. Yeah, so uh, November 17th in Palo Alto, we have the annual Z3 conference, which is all about Zionism, Israel, the Jewish uh, world. Uh, we've got Naftali Bennett, former prime minister, giving a keynote. We have Adela Kuchav, uh, a fantastic young lawyer, giving the other keynote. Ayla Levy will be there. I'll be there. Alyssa will be there. And I hope you will, too. And there's a free online registration because we're webcasting the plenary sessions uh, at zqproject.org. Very cool. Be sure to go to z3project.org. Also, the link will be in the bio of this episode. Okay, so... As David and Alyssa know, and as my listeners know, my podcast has a tradition, the four minute bad Jew challenge where you tell your life story in four minutes. However, typically when it's one person, they get four minutes because it's two people, we're splitting into two minutes. So who wants to go first, Alyssa or David? Okay, okay. Alyssa, we'll choose you. <laughs> <laughs> Alyssa, okay. here's the two minute bad Jew challenge. Are you ready? Always. Excellent. All right. My name is Alyssa Bernstein. I originally hail from Greenwich, Connecticut, was born in New York City, sort of a Jewish Mecca, if you will, if you will of the United States. Um, I was raised in a very, you know, pretty traditional conservative Jewish home. I went to Hebrew school, went to Jewish summer camp growing up, starting at age seven, um, kept, you know, did Shabbat every week, kept kosher. Um, and when I was 10, moved to Palo Alto, where I did middle school and high school and remained very involved in Jewish issues through USY and BBYO. And I taught I was a madricha at my shul. Um, so Judaism has always kind of been the guidepost for my life. My life has always functioned on a Jewish calendar. Um, I still sort of internally understand the new year to be the Jewish new year far more so than the Gregorian new year. Um, I feel like my internal clock functions uh, on, the, on the Jewish calendar. Um, I have always been a very proud Jew. I've always worn my Judaism on my sleeve, and I've always had a deep and profound connection to the state of Israel. Um, but I, I didn't think that I was going to pursue this full time. And when I went to school and I was in college in Northeast LA, I realized that there were a lot of young people, even young Jews, who had a lot of animosity towards Israel, didn't understand the complexities of the conflict, and it led me to a path of advocacy. Uh, which led me to American Jewish Committee, where I work now as the assistant director of the LA office, uh, where I manage our political outreach and legislative advocacy. And it has been a wild ride. And I am so pleased, um, despite any obstacle that I've had, that I have had the opportunities to get to where I am today. Awesome. You nailed the two minute challenge. I really appreciate you making that pivot and explaining your life so well. David, do you have what it takes? We'll find out. All right. Excellent. It's time. It's time. Shalom. Yalla. Hi, I'm David Hazoni. Um, I was born in Princeton, New Jersey, and went to high school in Brooklyn, Massachusetts. Uh, born to Israeli parents, grew up speaking Hebrew at a time when not a lot of people spoke Hebrew in America. Uh, grew up in a home that was tradition-facing, but not really observant. Started college at Columbia University, uh, got smitten by religion, spent a year in yeshiva, transferred to Yeshiva University, 
went all the way in, uh, made Aliyah in 1994 at the age of 24 in the middle of like the Oslo crisis, uh, helped start a think tank that my older brother Yoram started called the Shalem Center, became the editor of its journal, left that, um, had a lot of kids, uh, became less religious again later, uh, came to DC for four years to work at a group, a group called the Israel Project, got into books, got married again, uh, had more kids, and uh, uh, now I am uh, the starting a think tank called the Z3 Institute, which is based in Palo Alto, but I live in Jerusalem, where I love living in Jerusalem. Uh, now my kids are in the army and they're fighting in the war, which is crazy. And uh, uh, But I have a lot of hope and a lot of optimism and a lot of uh, books to bring you. Awesome. 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 Well done. Well, you both nailed the two-minute challenge. And by the way, as someone who is soon heading to Yeshiva for a year in Jerusalem, I'll be at Ish Torah starting in January. I look forward to meeting you, God rowing. And uh, that's too. really exciting. So uh, this is really, really neat. And I'm really glad, glad you, you jumped on board today. Okay, so let's start the podcast. You want to know what has happened to youth and why they don't know where they have come from. Where do you guys think we have lost this? I'm going to start with Alyssa because she's actually here in America. I know that you have been in America before in your life, David. And she's, yeah. Alyssa is in the battlefront of the domestic front as we speak. So Alyssa, why don't young Jews know where they come from at this point? It's a very good question. Um, it's something I talk a lot about in my uh, in an essay that I've written um, for for this book, Young Zionist Voices, um, and it. I think a lot of it comes from decades of um, sort of forced and willing assimilation in the United States following uh, the Holocaust. Um, you know, our grandparents' generation came to the U.S. for those who came to the United States from Europe or Middle East and North Africa, where they were persecuted, ethnically cleansed, and also um, attempted genocide and whose families were likely killed and um, in, in the war and through genocide and concentration camps and otherwise came to the United States with the understanding that uh, to be a proud Jew was dangerous. And so I think a huge part of why young Jews um, sort of don't understand where they come from is because, A, I think a lot of people have grandparents who find difficulty talking about their history. They have difficulty talking about their family history, not only in the Holocaust, but before. Um, so there's a lack of connection to the dangers that um, that face the Jewish community when democracy is threatened, when fascism rises. I think there's a lack of understanding of how uh, vulnerable we really can be and still are, despite you know the strides that we've made in the United States. And I also think that years of assimilation um, that has come through a fear of being targeted has distanced young Jews from their identities, which has made them less inclined to understand you know, what Judaism means to them. Um, I think we have come to a place where many people, including many Jews and many young Jews, um, misunderstand Judaism to be only a religion um, or only a culture. And I think that there's a lack of understanding of the fact that we are a, an ethnicity, we're a people, and you can be, you know, a, a convert and be a religious Jew, or you can be a cultural Jew who doesn't believe in God and those things exist. Um, but we also have, you know, we're people that have thousands of years lineage that trace back all the way back, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago to Judea Samaria, which is modern day Israel. Um, it's where the word Judaism comes from. So I think part of it, as I said, was assimilation. I think also, you know, growing up, I had such a strong Jewish identity at home um, and education at home about tradition and observance. But I don't think that unless you're in Jewish day school, you know, young Jews have had adequate education about Jewish history outside of the Holocaust um, and uh, and outside of sort of like the last 50 to 60 years. Um, there are thousands of years of history of Jews being expelled from all different countries, um, from Spain, from, you know, Middle East and North Africa, all the way back to the expulsion from uh, from Israel, you know, the first time around. And I don't think that people under don't they don't understand that lineage. Um and I think that we need to do more to push that education and whether that be at Sunday school and Jewish day school at summer camp so that people understand our history outside of 
the subjugation that we've faced. Um, because I think as soon as you start to associate your identity with, um, you know, just being a, a victim to persecution and oppression, which is certainly part of our history, um, you know, you want to distance yourself from that identity because you don't want to be associated with sort of a people that are um, kind of labeled as victims throughout history. Uh, but there's so much triumph and power in our history as well. And I think we need to do a better job of teaching our young people that those stories. Yeah. And, you know, I will say that I can relate to what you've said on, in two different ways. And I find it really interesting because I've thought about it to some degree, but never to the point that you illustrated, which is the first one is that, you know, a big part of my Jewish journey, as I've talked about on this podcast and previous episodes, has a little bit, has a lot to do with my grandma. And I don't, I'm not going to get into the whole story about, you know, my religious journey and how I've grown since then. But I will say that when my grandma was on her deathbed and the rabbi that was willing to meet with her was a Chabad rabbi, my grandma's first response was to apologize. Okay. We're like fourth generation Russian, Polish, Austrian background. Right. And the Chabad rabbi asked, why are you apologizing? He says, cause I'm not that religious. And you know, on her, only on her deathbed did she learn the Shema for the first time in her life, which is one of those central prayers to Judaism. Right. And the only reason why she had so little education, such a complete detachment is because when her parents immigrated to the United States after being chased out of Russia because of the pogroms, right. Um, her parents decided to protect Lucy, my grandma, as well as others, by not practicing their Judaism, because to be a proud Jew was endangering, right? Mm -hmm. Then there's the other aspect of it, right? Take what her, my, well, my, well, my great grandparents' decision, you know, four generations later, now I'm in the nice pluralistic world that is secular Judaism, and I've been quite immersed in it. So, an area that where I've personally struggled is being a Moisha House resident. And being mm -hmm. a Moisha House resident, for those who are familiar, you know, I run the Venice Moisha House. I love it. It's a really, really fun time. However, Moisha House doesn't have any kind of religious requirement, which is a good thing, in my opinion. At the same time, though, it does encourage a lot of secularism and a lot of veering away from the traditions. So you have a combination of generations ago, generationally leaving the religion and just being culturally Jewish. Again, nothing wrong with that. But the problem is then there's no acknowledgement of what was. And so when you have a system like Moisha House, you are encouraging the past to remain the way it was, and there's a lack of growth, and thus there is a stagnation among the identity. David, I'm very curious, um, what did you recognize within young Jewish leaders, whether they're in Israel, in America, and what do you have a message for them? Well, look, um, a lot of what I've been thinking about young Jewish leaders comes out of the experience of October 7th. Um, I live in Jerusalem. I experienced October 7th as an Israeli. Uh, like most Israelis, I knew people who know people who were either victims or kidnapped or killed. Um, and when I, and I came to the United States about two weeks later, because we were launching this big book, Jewish Priorities, which was sort of this amazing, vast compendium of like, what did Jews think from across the spectrum? And, and then October 7th happened. And one of the things that I noticed already was that Israelis, Israelis my age, were very powerfully inspired by younger Israelis, by my kids' age, by hundreds of thousands of Israeli young people just spontaneously going to the army or volunteering or doing everything that had to be done to protect and rebuild, not just to fight the war, but also to protect the, the communities that had been evacuated and to help any way they could. And I was like, this is this is incredible. What an incredible young generation we have. And then I came to the U.S. and I and I saw something that was, on the one hand, very different, but on the other hand, very similar. Um, what was sim Well, what was different was that American Jews were going through a bit of a different trauma from Israeli Jews. Because on the one hand, there was shock and horror and trauma, but there was also fear. And there was loneliness. I heard the word loneliness over and over again from American Jews, which is something Israelis didn't really feel because suddenly the whole country was brought together like they never had been. Um, and I saw a lot of mobilization of sort of established Jewish communities for Israel. Okay. But they weren't mobilizing, at least not yet, for the American Jewish community. And I thought this is, this is a little scary because 
Israel is going to be okay. Israel has $140 billion a year in an annual budget of the government. It has an army that's a lot more powerful than its enemies. So eventually we're going to be okay. But this vast wave of anti-Semitism that's erupting across the diaspora, across the world, on campuses, in urban centers, that's something that, that we're going to have to pay attention to. And you know who saw it were the young people because they lived it. Right, they're the ones who have to look at the hatred in the eyes of their fellow students. They're the ones who who uh, have to sit in classes while, you know, this long list of lies about Israel is that they have to listen to. This is, this is it's for the young people that the question of Jewish identity suddenly comes, just hits them in the face super hard. And what you saw in a lot of campuses, in a lot of places, uh, uh, young professionals and rabbis under a certain age. They just kind of spontaneously said, "We're going to fight back," and on every in every place it was different, C creative ways of fighting back. Sometimes all alone, sometimes with a, a local grassroots group. And so, I was actually really moved because it, it reminded me of the feeling that I had in Israel with the, with the younger generation, and that's what kind of inspired this idea of doing this book, Young Zionist Voices, because now we've got thirty one people, all of them under 30 years old, a lot of them are campus leaders, really coming together and forming a movement. It's kind of a way of planting a flag in the sand and saying, hey, you know, there's something new happening. Now, I'm I, one thing that your listeners all know is that the Soviet Jewry movement of the 1970s, 1980s, I was, I was involved in that. I went to demonstrations and, you know, watched for Sharansky and for Ida Nudel and for all of these famous refuseniks. That movement had a huge impact on American Jewry, on established American Jewry. A lot of the people who were leaders of that movement ended up becoming major leaders. Now, I think that the new movement of fighting back against anti-Semitism from young people today has the potential to fundamentally change what Jewish life is like in America over the next 20, 30 years. And these are the new leaders. The question is, are the established legacy institutions going to step aside and give and listen to them? Are they going to hear what they have to say? Because what you're seeing is a very powerful, very passionate, even when it's coming from people who didn't necessarily have a strong attachment, when forced to make a choice and they see what they're up against, there's so many people who really, st really stepped up and stood up and said, I'm a Jew. But okay. on the contrary, so yeah. just on, on the contrary for a second, What's also passionate and what's also very powerful is the anti-Zionist movement. Now, the anti-Zionist movement, whether you're on one side of the political spectrum or not, you know, has taken a hit because of Donald Trump's uh, uh, election, uh, winning the election in their most recent, you know, polls. So I'm very curious uh, to both of you, whoever wants to answer this, you know, is the anti-Zionist movement something that is strong enough to completely overwhelm the, um, I'm going to call it the anti-anti-Semitism movement, you know, the anti-Jew hatred movement? You know, there's clearly a clash happening. There's a culture clash happening as a nation. And Jewish youth that are involved, when I say Jewish youth, I'm talking about literal youth to young Jewish professionals, people under the age of 30, right? It's harmful. And it also drives a lot of fear to the point where people don't even want to involve themselves anymore. So I'm very curious, what are your experiences about? Um, short answer, well, will it? So why don't you tell them about the AJC uh, study that was done in the spring about uh, the surge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we every year come out with a report. It's called the State of Anti-Semitism uh, in America Report, um, where we compare and contrast Jewish Americans with uh, the general public, their views on anti-Semitism. Um, and what we're seeing is that, A, as a matter of fact, and as any you know Jewish person in America kind of can tell just based off of their gut feeling, we have seen a dramatic spike in anti-Semitism. Um, the majority of Jews have experienced anti-Semitism, whether that be online or in person in the last year. And this, again, was for 2023. So um, we're not even thinking about what's happened since the start of, of 2024. And there's certainly been no lack of uh, hatred towards the Jewish community since then. Um, 
to your question, will the anti-Zionist movement overwhelm us? My short answer is no. I mean, we are living proof that hate does not define nor overwhelm us. Six million of us were brutally murdered in the Holocaust, and we still stand strong. And we have so many incredible, successful Jewish leaders in this country across all sectors and outside of this country. Um, we have been attacked and persecuted and oppressed, and people have tried to forcefully convert us and forget um, our heritage. And time and time again, we have shown them that that doesn't work. So in short, no, it will not overwhelm us. Does that mean that it is not harmful to society? No. And the anti-Zionist movement is a very organized, uh, very organized and very powerful movement that has also galvanized a lot of particularly young Jewish anti-Zionist voices to further strengthen the movement, um, which, of course, as we all on this call know, is a, is a pretty horrific example of you know, tokenizing uh, a minority community to prove some broader point, to use them as pawns in, in a greater um, movement, and that's a problem. Um, but it is harmful. We've seen in recent decades, um, you know, probably the last 50 years increasingly so, and it's kind of creeped up on us slowly but surely, um, anti-Zionism, um, which has sort of been coupled with other um, kind of identity politics movements and, and ideas of intersectionality, has seeped into academia, has seeped into our diversity, equity, and inclusion offices in um, the corporate world. It has seeped into our government. And, um, you know, I think it would be a mistake to say that it's not, it doesn't come with its risks and with its potential damage to society. Um, I think it is part of a larger movement of, um, or not movement, but a, a larger pattern of sort of an inability to understand or comfortably disagree with people whose opinions differ from your own. But I think fundamentally anti-Zionism in particular comes from a fundamental misunderstanding of what the Zionist movement is. Um, it has sort of been co-opted by uh, bad actors um, and defined as something that necessitates the destruction of Palestinians and their land and necessitates the obliteration of a Palestinian state, which for the vast majority of Jews is absolutely not the case. It is not how they feel. I don't know a single Jewish Zionist who believes that a Jewish state can exist without a Palestinian state. Everybody that I know in my life views the Jews and Palestinians as cousins, and the, and, and the sovereignty of both peoples are not mutually exclusive. Um, so I think that this is a movement which is based in a, in a really deep misunderstanding of, yes, of Zionism and of Israel, but fundamentally um, of the Jewish community. And I believe strongly that if we want to better understand the Jewish community, if we want to understand our practices, if we want to understand Zionism, I think people, um, I think inappropriately seek to understand um Israel by trying to understand the global Jewish community when I think it's the inverse. If you seek, if you want to better understand the global Jewish community, you need to understand Israel and its history because that is the epicenter, that is the heartbeat of Jewish life, and it always has been. And a lot of people at the same time forget that, or not forget, but like intentionally try to undermine that connection between Jews and the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. Even so much so that the secular Jews that we were describing today that are disengaged like they know that Israel is an important part of our history, but they also can't justify logically or historically or contextually why there's even a connection to that. And I'm curious, David, as the person who's currently living in Israel, what are some of the solutions you might have for that? Look, I, I think that, um, first, first of all, I want to address something that Alyssa said. Um, I think that, that the movement of anti-Semitism that we're seeing is very loud but it's not very powerful. Okay, it's very loud. It has a lot of people joining it, um, but but the numbers are not there. And it's also part of an attack, not just on Jews. Okay, it's a movement that attacks America, that attacks Western civilization, that attacks a whole string of fundamentals, uh, fundamental realities, fundamental beliefs that the entirety of Western civilization is built on. Generally speaking, the moment something like that gets to a certain size, there's a pushback. 
Americans in particular don't love people who burn the American flag. Okay. And that pushback is beginning. It's beginning uh, at the level of, first at the level of philanthropy to universities. Okay. It's at the level of lawsuits based on the Civil Rights Act. Um, I think that you're right that the election of President Trump uh, will also affect, will, will, will change the sense of momentum of that movement. They were on the rise, and now they're going to be on the defensive uh, at the at the level of government and law. But most importantly, is that the Jews themselves are not the same Jews as in the pogroms uh, and in the Holocaust. The Jews today are more powerful. Okay, they're financially more powerful. They're politically more powerful. And they have a, a, a network that includes the state of Israel that gives them resources, communications, tactics. And the most important thing for all of that is maintaining the spirit, the fighting spirit of the Jew, which itself comes from Jewish engagement. And the study that I was hinting at, referring to, there were actually two studies that came out in 2024, in the spring, many months into the war, one by the AJC and the other by the Jewish federations, that show that a really massive, what they're calling a surge of Jewish engagement that has taken place at all age levels uh, across American Jew the American Jewish community since October 7th. Okay, People are being attacked for being a Jew, and they're saying, wait, if I'm going to be attacked for being a Jew, i got to know more about what that means. And also, I'd like to spend more time around, around fellow Jews rather than constantly just standing in front of this attack. So we're, we have the tools. And we have the youth who are, uh, who are just really amazingly powerful and passionate and creative and committed, much more so than I think we may have thought before. Um, so I'm actually quite optimistic about the future of American Jewry. I don't believe the anti-Semites have the ability to overrun us. I think that we're an ancient people. Okay, we've got 3,000 years of dealing with this stuff under our belts, and we will find the pathways to protect ourselves and to deepen ourselves and to win this war. Yeah, you know, and I, I want to take the second right now to give a shout out to someone that I've, I keep on seeing on social media. I've met him a few times because of my job here at Asia Torah, because I'm also, David doesn't know this, also the chief marketing officer of Asia Los Angeles, but I'm also, you know, someone who's quite involved and is, you know, October 7th, I saw this guy again, really great guy named Eli Sivas, who has popped up on social media a few times for being a loud and outspoken Zionist at UCLA where the encampments are frivolous. And <clears throat> what I've, what I've, you know, when I speak to him, when I, when I see him, he pretty much echoes just that he is the embodiment of what you just described where, you know, students like him are stepping up, putting out the Israeli flag, educating themselves and they're educating themselves, not because necessarily they wanted to initially, but because they had to. And, you know, no one ever asked to be an expert on the Israel Palestine geopolitical conflict of the Middle East. But after October 7th, every single Jew was held liable to be one. And it's kind of frustrating, but it's also been very empowering. And it's been something very encouraging. And I've learned a ton. I've actually learned a ton because of the trolls on the internet. So for example, okay, when a troll on the internet comments on my content that just has to do with Jewish education, and they go, oh yeah, well, how come the Ashka normative uh, uh, world that is Israel is required, it doesn't allow you to get a DNA test it's like, wait, what? Never heard of this before. Have you, have you guys heard this trope before? It's crazy. So I go ahead and look it up. I'm like, what are they talking about? And I was like, oh, well, Israel has a different process for DNA tests, but that doesn't mean they're not preventing you from it. And it doesn't mean it's Ashka normative or whatever the hell it is, <laughs> right? So, which is a totally anti-Semitic term in itself, but it's just, it's kind of hilarious how trolls have actually helped me grow Jewishly, where different moments like that make me a better researcher mm -hmm. and a better Zionist. Mm -hmm. So... Well, you know why? It's not a surprise because the Jewish people have always has have always been one to step up in the face of hate. We aren't sitting ducks, nor have we ever been. And I think that we have this unique kind of fire in us to respond to hate with love and with resilience, unlike any people I've I've, I've ever seen. Um, I. My, the fact that I that I do what I do for a living is a testament to that fact. I was looking at, 
I, I was studying psychology in Spanish. I wanted to be a therapist. And my experiences on campus with anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism were what forced me to spring into action. And that's what's happening with young Jews following the October 7th attack. Um, it's not a surprise to me that their first experience, and for many people, it is their first experience, seeing how hatred against the Jewish people and against Israel um, impacts their day to day. It's now in their backyard. This hatred is now on their territory. It's on their turf. Um, and as anybody would, if somebody's barging into your home or, you know, wants to throw punches at you or the ones you love, you're going to defend yourself and you're going to stand up and say, no, you're not going to harm me. And I, and you're going to stand up proudly. And I, it's not a surprise to me that young Jews are doing that. Um, I just think it's unfortunate that that pride and determination, um, has to come through experiencing such rampant hate. Can I say something about Hanukkah? Please. Please do. You know, we're, we're heading towards Hanukkah, and here in Jerusalem, the bakeries have already started selling the donuts. That's how you know it's almost Hanukkah. Can you shit, Mulan? Um, what? <laughs> I, get, I only allow myself one a year because they're so good. And, you know, but I learned something recently about Hanukkah, which is that, you know, you, you come to Israel and, and, and you learn about the story of Hanukkah very differently from in America, okay? In Israel, you're told Hanukkah is about the Maccabees. It's about the war against like the Seleucid Greeks who like wanted to destroy Judaism and we went to war for our independence and we won. And in America, we were taught Hanukkah is about this miracle with this oil that lasted eight days. It was only supposed to last one day. And I always thought that was a really weird clash because it's like two completely different holidays. So it turns out that going way, way back, there were these books, the books of Maccabees. There was the story of Hanukkah, which was in fact the story of a war, a war against anti-Semites, where the Jews fought back. And then we had a few wars, and then we fought against the Romans, and we, we got our temple destroyed. And then we fought another rebellion in the second century and got completely decimated. And that's when the rabbi said, okay, you know what, maybe we shouldn't be encouraging wars. So let's like talk about this this miracle with the oil, and that'll be Hanukkah. And when the Zionist movement started, and, and they needed to build the fighting spirit of the Jews, they resurrected the original Hanukkah story. Okay, and that became the way Hanukkah is taught in Israel, in schools. Yeah, they hear about the miracle, about the oil, but really it's about the Maccabees. Okay, so... Uh, when we started doing Young Zionist Voices, when we made this book, so that the the foreword is written by Elon Levy, who was a real fighting Jew. He was the spokesman for the wartime spokesman for the Prime Minister's office and from the State of Israel, and now he runs the Citizen Spokesman's Bureau. It has an afterward by Zach Bodner, who's also a real fighter. He's the the head of the JCC in Palo Alto, the Austrian Family JCC, which hosts the Z3 Project. So he writes in the book, "These are the new Maccabees." Okay, we need to understand that what that these young people are the Maccabees. Okay, there is a fighting spirit. We have an ancient, ancient fighting spirit that says, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna assimilate in our own land because these Greeks come. I don't care how big their army is. Okay, this is our land. This is who we are. This is our ancient birthright and our ancient calling. And we have no choice in the matter. We're going to stand, we're gonna fight. And when you when you're faced against that, your enemies start to say, wait a minute, okay, maybe these aren't. Maybe this whole, what Alyssa was talking about before, about training your identity to see yourself as a victim and that to be a Jew is, to, is the Holocaust and to be a Jew is to be slaughtered. Maybe that's kind of sending the wrong signal to our enemies. And that today, if we want to win this war, if we want to stand up for ourselves and live free and full Jewish lives in the diaspora, we have to be fighters. We have to be Maccabees, every single one of us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important message heading towards, uh, towards Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. Before we wrap up this podcast, I would love to ask both of you to speak to a listener who has struggled to speak up, who has struggled to find the right words to defend themselves, who has struggled to wear their Jewish Star of David necklace on the outside of their shirt as opposed to the inside of their shirt. What advice do you have for them and how can they be a prouder Maccabee today? So when... Uh, the refusing movement began in the Soviet Union, the first thing that they did was to start learning more about being Jewish. 
Okay. You, you can't stand up against all these things that sound like arguments. They're really just attacks. But all these claims, all these arguments, if you yourself don't have a, a battery of knowledge. Okay. So you have to love yourself as a Jew. And to love yourself is to learn about yourself, to learn about your history, to learn about your, your past, to learn about your religion, to learn about your culture, to learn Hebrew. Okay. That's the number one step always towards having the, 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 the muscles and the backbone and every, everything that you need in order to fight and make it a permanent part of your life. It's very empowering and very therapeutic. Alyssa, how about you? I think what I would like for people to understand is that, yes, learn about your history, learn about our traditions and observance, and also know that regardless of what traditions you adhere to or how observant you are or whether or not you've been to Israel or you have family there, you are Jewish enough. You do not have to prove anything to anybody. You don't have to be a certain kind of Jew to be appealing to other people. Um, you are, there's no such thing as Jewish. I hear that a lot. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew. If you live and breathe Judaism and that is what is in your heart, you are Jewish enough and you do not have to prove it to anybody but yourself. Arming yourself with knowledge is simply a tool for you to further strengthen your own identity and it allows avenues for you to explore different ways of expressing that identity within your community and outside of it. But regardless of how you identify religiously, culturally, or otherwise, you are Jewish enough. I was going to say one more thing. You're not alone. You're okay, you're really not alone. You might feel alone, but there's a whole network, there's a whole world of Jews who are going through what you're going through and are working together and willing to work together with you to build whatever tools you need to, to stand up and fight. Absolutely. American Jewish Committee, AJC, is just one of many. It's where I work. AJC roped me in as a college student when I felt alone and I felt like my voice wasn't being heard as a student. And they gave me the resources I needed to speak to my administration, to bring speakers to campus, to put important programs on. We implemented the school's first ever anti-Semitism awareness training. I would never have been able to do that without AJC. There are organizations out there who want to help you, who have the resources, the depth of knowledge, the subject matter experts. AJC is just one of many, but please reach out if ever you feel alone or need support. There are leaders, both individual and organizational, that will do whatever it takes to support you. I want to add one more idea to the two things that you just said, and so poignant, so helpful, so inspiring. I really do appreciate both of you for what you have to say. Here's what I want to say to the audience as well, uh, especially for those who are more knowledgeable and for those who are, might even be more religious and more connected to God. Make it a point not just to educate or attempt to educate the trolls. We spend so much time arguing against the trolls and those who want to attack us, the pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas movement, the people online that want to keep on recreating these inflammatory um, arguments where we forget to educate our own kind. So I want to put it out there that one thing that I think needs to happen is that we're putting so much effort into arguing against people who are not there for a dialogue, but as David pointed out, they're just there to really attack us verbally. So what we have to do is instead refocus the energy and educating those that are less connected. I mentioned Moisha House earlier, which is a very, in my opinion, from what I've observed, a very disconnected community from this whole entire thing. When you have a lot of nice experiences that are nice and fluffy, it's very easy to forget what's happening across the Middle East. But this is the time right now to empower those communities because right now those communities are the most vulnerable and yet that's your unharnessed potential of fighting force. So this is the time right now to reach out to them and to implement programs where they actually can be, where they can be educated and empowered, really learn about who they are. A Jew cannot represent themselves if they are not educated. That's the moral of the story. Hard end. Hard stop. Absolutely. It's not simple. We, whether we want to or not, any member of a minority community, especially Jews right now, we are soldiers in a war that we did not ask for. So we may as well show up to this war with sword in hand. Well said. Well said. Everyone, please go check out the Z3 conference coming out. When is it coming out? Z3 conference is uh, is on Sunday, November 17th in Palo Alto and online. 
Uh, and we're launching Young Zionist Voices the same day. Love it. Z3project.org. And as far as Young Zionist Voices, Alyssa is now a published author. Alyssa, congratulations. I'm really, really proud Thank of you. you. And you. Uh, yeah, no, it's just, it's really cool. Multiple friends of mine are now becoming published authors. I, I feel so left behind. I'm really jealous, but You're I'm, really excited. <laughs> I'm really excited to read your essay along with many other essays about what it means to be a young Jewish professional and a Zionist in such a crazy, turbulent time. So to all the listeners, thank you so much for tuning into this podcast about Jew. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you. Thank you. Shalom.